How's everybody tonight? It's a nice little crowd. You guys, everyone enjoy the food out there? Yeah. Is, there is there something that you guys liked in particular? Anybody? Yes. All right. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's great. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, so I'm going to read through a little bit of an intro and kind of uh, before we dive into our actual subject matter so I can do our introductions as well. So my name is uh, Justin Phillips. Welcome to tonight's program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Tonight we have four very special panelists with us. We have uh, Caleb Zegas, the executive director of La Cocina. We also have Veronica Salazar, owner of El Haracha Loco. We have Reem Asil, owner of Reem's California. And we have Lumise DeBoer, chef and owner of Mama Lumise. And what was something that you told me backstage, Caleb? Oh, and uh, Mama Lumise, which will open soon at the Emeryville Public Market. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> up, up here getting insider info right That's now. That's right. Very good stuff. Um, so they're all featured in We Are La Cocina, a new cookbook that the reason why we're all here tonight not only showcases recipes from over 50 La Cocina graduates, but also highlights their inspiring stories. Uh, so I want to dive into La Cocina itself. So La Cocina means the kitchen in Spanish began in 2005. It's been helping local food entrepreneurs, many of whom are women or low-income immigrant women, develop their small businesses. Uh, at this point, Caleb, you have 50 chefs in this program that have become self-sufficient business owners. Uh, many have opened their own brick-and-mortar restaurants. And then we also have people like Knight Young and Rima Seal, who were even semi-finalists for James Beard Awards, which is absolutely <laughs> incredible. <laughs> yeah. um, so now we have a book that compiles all of their stories called We Are La Cocina, Recipes in Pursuit of the American Dream. Um, so my only question, my first question for Caleb is, dude, what took so long? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been lucky enough to be at the organization uh, since 2005, since the first year that we opened. And in around 2009, Letitia Landa, who's the co-author and our deputy director, and I started to float the idea of a book. I was a very young uh, leader at an organization with a board that was fairly skeptical. And uh, honestly, we went to McSweeney's because we really wanted to make like a non-traditional <laughs> book. We had lots of big ideas. We had meetings with Sarah Billingsley, who ultimately became the editor uh, of this book at Chronicle, and, and really put forth a book idea. And the board came back to us and asked that we not do it at that time. And at the time, that was, amongst many other things, this feeling of I had so much left to prove with the organization to be able to do the things that I thought this organization was capable of. And in hindsight, was one of many things that I think the wisdom of the board really paid off in giving us the space and time to tell a story that was more comprehensive uh, and for that more powerful. So the, the book itself took us a little bit longer than I, I thought it would. And it's, it's not all of the stories. We had to still cut stories. There are businesses that have started at La Cocina since we wrote the book. So hopefully it's a one chapter in lots of stories that this organization has to tell. But for us, it was try, trying to find a, a publisher that would want to tell the stories in the way that we wanted to tell them and to be able to find the time to spend that we needed with the entrepreneurs to try to capture those stories in a way that was true to their voices. So when the idea came up and you had to have conversations with the chefs, like, do you guys remember when Caleb came up to you and was like, hey, I have an idea for, we're going to do a cookbook at this point. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Eddie? Yes. He said, we're going to do a cookbook. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I need like two, one or two from your dishes, like at your menu. And I am, um, I, in the beginning when I attended La Cuisine, I was like really doing bad in how to put, you know, the recipe of my dishes and the ingredients that way. That was the, part, the good part about La Cucina. They hooked me up with a restaurant consultant mm -hmm. who helped me over like my dishes, putting the ingredients because in the beginning, let me see how you make McLuba. And I said, oh, put salt, put food. Yeah, little little bit and the, of this. you know, the way my mom gets you, so <laughs> just like putting And he said, no, 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 this is not going to work. I actually have, yeah. I have a 12 text message stream from Lamise that I really wanted to put 
in the book. <laughs> Just instead of a recipe, I wanted it to be screenshots of the 12 text messages that Lemmy sent me about how to make this one dish. <laughs> I, I came out perfect. I made it just like yeah. she texted me. <laughs> he said, let me say, I would love to make makluba like your makluba that you did. And I said, okay, do this, do that, do this. Do. But at the end, it turns to be perfect. <laughs> he said, let me say, it was perfect. Yeah, so the cookbook was a good idea. You know, we want to give, you know, people an idea like how my grandma get used to cook, you know, our dishes, you know, the traditional way, you know. Mm -hmm. Even we are presenting now, like for this generation and the coming generation, but we want to keep, you know, the traditional dish that goes like a hundred years back mm. to our, like, you know, ho like our home country. Yeah. And Veronica, what about what about you? Do you remember? I, I was at La Cocina in, in 2005. And they always talking about the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a really good uh, recipe friend. In Mexico, we always like like to do our, like our mother, my mom teach me like I know all the res all my single recipe just in my mind. But when I been in La Cocina, Caleb always pushing me like you have to have your recipes for your employees, and you, and I say no, it's gonna be fine, and it's gonna be always. Mm -hmm. So they push me and they t teach me, which is good. And now I'm in the book and uh, share some of my recipes. I think it's a good idea to have this and to share to all the people. And I've been waiting so long, like the yeah. same age of La Cocina. So I'm so ca happy to be in the book, to share all these stories. Um, for me, it was really funny because, like Caleb said, I want to just borrow like one or two hours of your time. And I remember like that day that we were sitting for him to tell my story. And I felt like I had gone through a really hard therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> it was like reliving this story. And it was like so much about everything around the food and not necessarily the food itself. And I was like, oh my God, like I didn't even realize. It's like, it's funny when people ask you your story, you don't, like you tell so much of your story through your food to be, but to be able to articulate that, mm -hmm. um, I think was like a really... Um, healing process for me. Um, I had the opposite situation in which uh, I had like learned how to scale up all my recipes and then they <laughs> wanted me to bring it back down for a home cook. <laughs> that was really hard for me. I'm like used to cooking for like an army now. <laughs> um, so that, that, was, that was really interesting. But I do remember where I like I have such a connection to my recipes that I remember like I don't know, it was like something on Instagram and one of the recipe testers were like testing out my spinach pies. And I think they were like sauteing the onions. And I remember like texting Caleb like, do not put that in there. You cannot saute the onions before you put them in the spinach pie. Like I was very, very, you know, and I felt very attached. Like this is like your heart going out in the book and you want to make sure it's like exactly right for the home cook to be able to replicate it. So... Um, I thought I learned a lot about myself through that process. I have like three little comments. <laughs> go, go for it. <laughs> uh, number In one, defense like of to, <laughs> to, re to Reen's point, we were really intentional about how we did the book. Like, A, yes, it's a ton of recipes, but also the stories are really important to us. But we knew that we had... Uh, these entrepreneurs have often cooked uh, without recipe and then been really aggressively forced into recipe writing. <laughs> and then to ask them to take themselves out of recipe writing and think about being a home cook again is like a really rude thing for us yeah. to do. <laughs> and so we were really intentional about the partners we brought into the project. And we had an incredible recipe writer, uh, Yawande Kumalafe, who worked with us on the book. Um, and so I think it's just, it's cool to see that. And her, she herself writes a little bit at the end of the book about what it was like to go through and do these recipes with these women in the book, which I think was a pretty transformative experience for her too, which is really cool. The other thing is that I've gotten to spend time uh, with all of these entrepreneurs, like Reem said, I got to sit down and do the interviews. I first met Veronica in her home uh, when she was selling food from her home. And for Lamise's recipes and her interview, you'll see we photographed in her home. And so one of the things I think is so special about the book is that we're, we're trying to show you where all these entrepreneurs come from, which is a wide variety of spaces. And so you get to go inside of Lamise's home when she feeds basically 15 to 20 people out of a galley kitchen, the same food that you guys ate out here, or you get to see Veronica in this restaurant that she's built for herself, which is as much of a home because she's there with her three kids nearly every single day. And so I think it's, it's unique in, in the way that cookbooks are in that sense, that you're really getting a different, a different idea about what these places are made of, the kind of people that make these places. That's great. There's a, uh, there's a passage in this book that I think kind of sums up 
Maybe not sums up, but kind of shines a light on some of the things that you guys said. And uh, in that passage, it's in the introduction, and says, this isn't a book about restaurants or even exclusively about food. Instead, it's about the people that make your food, who open restaurants, not merely a glimpse behind the kitchen door of a talented chef, but also a sustained and passionate argument for wider opportunity. It's a, uh, I mean, I, I think that says so much about this book itself. So, and I think whenever people pick up cookbooks, they're, the idea is that they're going to walk away with something. Caleb, like for you, having worked with such talented women in this, what do you, what do you think people will walk away from? And all, you know, this is to all of you guys as well. Yeah, I mean, my real hope is that people actually read them their way all the way through the book, which is not necessarily the way that I interact with a cookbook. So hopefully you start at the introduction and it really hooks you and, and you keep going. But by the time you get to the end of the book, you know, we hope that you've gotten this layered experience of what it's like to be in, in an America that could exist and, pro and should exist, but absolutely does not. And that, that you are poorer for the fact that that America is not more readily available. And so that you leave a little bit angry, uh, a little bit hungry, uh, and do something about it. Certainly cook the recipe, certainly celebrate the voices of the women in this book, but also make a sustained argument to the world around you that you have been robbed of some sort of joy because the way that we are set up doesn't allow uh, that abundance. Let me... Sp <laughs> <laughs> Can <you> <clears throat> So the question again <laughs> was, was what, do you, what do you want people to take away from the book? Like after okay, they get, yeah. so really, really, like I'd love to send a message to everyone that no matter what you're going through in life and you insist to do something, you're going to do it, you're going to do it. And this is where I raised my kids. Never been like in my life that I'm going to be a chef or food business or you know, like sending or giving ideas about Palestinian food to San Francisco Bay Area. But uh, whatever like hardship I went through, I was also, I'm surprised that the one who was behind this idea, she's here today attending. If you raise your hand, <laughs> she's the one. Yeah, Lupa Gomez is the manager where I live. And she, after she tried my food many times, she said, let me, this is something is not in the market. And definitely you're going to be a successful food business. And I'm aiming from this business it just and this cookbook to tell everyone that there is Palestinian dishes is not in the market, that there is a lot of yummy dishes. People has to know about it. Hopefully, and I was, to be honest with you, the most thing that makes me really happy when a Google company a week ago demonstrate my recipe uh, with like 900,000 subscribers, it turned the dish to be exactly how I am cooking it inside my house. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this book did the job that really for it, like made for it or published for it. So hopefully, you know, we're getting there and people try more and more about, you know, Palestinian food. That, let me say, that, that comment was very low key, but let's go back <laughs> yeah. to that 900,000. Can, 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 can both of you explain what exactly we're talking about? Let, yeah. let people know. Coming soon to a YouTube channel near you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lamise and uh, Alma, who owns a business in the book called Mixiotes, did back-to-back -back cooking demos on the Google campus for their... Uh, Google Foods YouTube channel. And so they sent their, their book ahead of time. The Google team cooked their recipe for the Google masses and then filmed as Lamise and Alma walked <laughs> through how to cook their dishes. And, and no lie, like I think Lamise and uh, Alma together would be the best cooking TV show uh, <laughs> ever. <laughs> It was, it was amazing just hearing the two of them tell about their stories, talk about their kids while kind of like making tortillas from scratch or sticking their fingers in a pot of water to tell you whether or not the rice is done. <laughs> it's just like, you know. Uh, I just told Caleb that was one of my happiest day in my life. Mm. Oh. Yeah. I was so happy. Like the way even the impression after we got done with the demo, people like giving hugs and asking for signature. I felt like this is really the most happy and successful day, you know. And the dish turned perfect. Everyone tried it and said, oh my God, that is so good. <laughs> 
So I passed the test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and Veronica, you as well, what do you, what do you want people to walk away from if they, they get the book? Or Not they also the, book? the recipes, but um, all the story of the woman, you know, all our life, everything behind what we cook, what we do. It's uh, really important for me. Uh, it was a lady, I don't know if she's around here. She, we asked her if she buy the book, and she's like, oh, I have a lot of cookbooks. And I, we told her, like, it's not just the book, it's not just the recipe, it's just big histories behind what, what you want to see. It's, it's, you want to see the, the world in just one book. And even me, um, I was reading um, Tina, his story, because I've been busy at the restaurant. You know, when you have your business, you're always busy and you don't know exactly, you know what, they, what people come in at, the, at, La Cocina, at La Cocina, but you never know the story. So we was reading, I was crying in the airplane, I was crying uh, when we were uh, doing the book in, in Los Angeles, because we don't know, I mean, we know what we do, what we eat, uh, we share our dishes, but never have time to, to share our history. So it's really important um, to, to buy that book support La Cocina and support us and you know you you know a little bit about every every woman um, um, business and Reem what about you as well yeah I think on that note like yeah I, I remember reading some of the stories it's like I was working side by side with some of these women <laughs> and I didn't know and it's like what would it take for us to actually know about each other's stories what would this world look like right if we took the time to hear about the stories behind, um, you know, what people do. Um, and, and I think for me, the learning, um, I, I, I do think just even buying the book is an act of solidarity. You're supporting an organization that's doing the amazing work. And like for my business, we wouldn't be successful without our community supporting us, you know? And, it feels so humbling to be a part of this community. I think that that is a takeaway that I took from the book. It's like, oh man, like we come from all these communities of struggle and together, because of all of that struggle, we know how to help each other. And what, what could that look like if we involved our community outside the book mm -hmm. to help us? Like what would the world look like? So I think buying the book is an act of solidarity because you get to support this organization. Um, but I think also kind of hopefully being a little hungrier, a little, you know, to take action, maybe to, you know, the next time you're out eating with a friend and they say something a little bit ignorant about <laughs> food from a certain <coughs> background that you like, that you challenge them or you question them, like those little acts. I then think then you change. buy them the book. And then you buy them the book. Yeah. Um, but, you know, slowly but surely, like we're more connected as a community and that we, we, It'll, the world will look a little different. So. Yeah. It's the, uh, one of the incredible things too is you guys aren't, these aren't people that are used to, you know, going out and being in front of crowds and having mm -hmm. to push books and products and all that. These are just, you know, extremely talented women who haven't had to do something like this. So with that said, you guys are also on a book tour and I feel like there's some highlights that we were talking about yeah. uh, backstage mm -hmm. that... Uh, would be interesting to hear. How's the how's the book tour been? Whoever wants to pick that up first. Well, Veronica, you and I were in L.A. You want to talk about what we we've did been so in L.A. It, it was so. I mean, something that I never feel before. I mean, we are important. I mean, not because we are because we are persons, and but um, I don't know. I, I didn't be in a long time with Caleb, <laughs> I, 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 with Caleb and Leticia, and when uh, we spent too much time with my uh, other friends, with Tina and Dilsa Lugo, and um, you know, signing this book and see this uh, was a small space um, with 40 people, 50 people. They saw interest in the book, and and when uh, one of the uh, participants. Uh, say his story, everybody was crying, even me, <laughs> everybody was crying. And, and it's, it's, so, it's so really good to, you know, this experience is, is for me, it's like, mama say it's something, it's one of the best uh, 
things in my life, you know. Um, I, I know I leave my family right now. I want to travel to New Year in two days. And I feel so sad because my, my, my two kids, uh, the little ones and my husband is going to stay here. But I, so I know it's going to be for my own good and, you know, for, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun. <laughs> Lamise, what about you as well? Like the, this book tour process, how has that been for you? I'm so excited to take a <laughs> vacation first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be work. You know, yeah. I, actually, you know, for my situation, I've been so it's like, I, I am the one who witnessed the Iraqi Kuwait war, mm -hmm. and that was tough, and then I immigrated to the United States, and unfortunately, I got, you know, married to a planned marriage, which is like, I end up, you know, a domestic violence victim, and having a living with those wonderful kids there mm -hmm. and you know I get used to work with the UN for almost 16 years and then for the consulate of Yemen for 10 years and after people you know tried my food and those kids asked me like for like uh, you know gift cards for the principal and teacher and I said what I don't have the budget for that forget it I can make a feast and the feast was the beginning of the idea you know mm -hmm. attending La Cocina mm -hmm. um, I never thought like I can be behind a computer working as a business administrator to turn to be a business owner and, you know, um, running a food business. But that was, I think, one of my dreams. I love to be in the kitchen 24-7, but I don't like to do dishes one second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my dream. So <laughs> definitely I'm hiring a dishwasher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love, you know, I, I love preparing, I love cooking, I love feeding people. Like when I cook inside my house, I, I live in a low housing income and I love to feed my neighbors. Even in Ramadan, people, they said, why are you giving us like food in a certain time? And I, I have to explain to them that this is Ramadan, but I'm really happy to be, you know, uh, be, you know, doing this business. And hopefully, you know, I'm dreaming to be successful. I'm trying my best. I'm working hard for the tour. I'm sorry, I'm, I jumped from the tour. So my kids has been asking me, Mama, go for a vacation, go. So I'm going with Caleb now, <laughs> <laughs> attending. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be my dream after like 33 years working nonstop. Oh, wow. That's wow. good. A lot yeah. of pressure for yeah. yeah. I was about to say. So yeah. by Cincinnati my Cincinnati is gonna be amazing. <laughs> They told me it's gonna be hot. It's gonna, but this is my first time leaving my kids behind, and you know, joining Caleb for that tour. Hopefully, and there is also a She's restaurant finally. called Frame in Hazel Park, Michigan. Hazel Park, Michigan. They're gonna do our recipe of the makluba. Uh, sorry, the the other dish, which is samak mashubil from baked fish, and we're gonna have uh, uh, like three, four seats. Yeah, we're doing uh, in in Hazel Park. We're actually going with Veronica's daughter, which I think is really yeah. a beautiful thing. And uh, Veronica's daughter, Lamise, and I are going to cook a, a Mexi Arab feast. Uh, so uh -huh. yeah, like a rice. Yeah, with with, with me. <laughs> but like a little rice and beans, where we'll do like a mujerra and then a rice and beans combo, tacos a la vez, which are like a you know, a story of Arab migration through Mexico that ends up being something that people you know. Love. I'm really happy this tour will like let other people know, other states, that this cookbook is done by amazing chefs, by an amazing, you know, nonprofit organization who took care of us and lead, lead us to be on that stage. So I'm really happy to have this tour in July. It's going to start from July 28th to August mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And we're going to, you know, cook and let other people from different states other chefs from different restaurants to try our food. So wish me luck, guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I almost... I almost feel like we should have another one of these events just to debrief on this vacation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, what happened? Where'd, where'd you guys go eat? All that stuff. Just our slideshow. 
Um, I mean, one of the things that I was saying to, to Justin in the back is that the it's you know I have, we have no idea what the book sales look like because books are a mysterious thing. But it's been about two weeks, and and for me, I've been doing this work for 14 years, and to be in LA with. Tina, who's a girl named Pinky and happens to be sitting in the front row, and Hang, who owns Noodle Girl, Veronica, Dilsa Lugo, who owns Los Cilantros. You know, we got to go to LA, then they went on to Fresno and San Diego, and all that was wonderful. We did some really beautiful things connecting with chefs and organizations in those cities, but for me, the most special part was seeing those four women find each other in new ways, and to get to go have Korean barbecue and not have to talk about work and not have to talk about the food. It's really nice to be out with a bunch of chefs who don't want to talk about the food. They just want to eat and laugh, because <laughs> yeah. mm. that's really what food is supposed to be, and uh, I feel like these chefs in particular aren't always uh, invited to be a part of those spaces. We were just in Aspen, Colorado at Food and Wine with Hina, who owns Beisharam, and Rosa, who owns Origen. And I've been in a lot of those kitchens where you're prepping food for tasting events, where the average cost is about $1,300 per person. And those are not always fun kitchens to be in. And there's a lot of people who have donated their time or who are working minimum wage to support those chefs, to feed those people who have paid for a big appeal. And the people who are working aren't having fun, but in our kitchen, it was fun. And people were speaking Hindi and Spanish and English. <laughs> and our food was amazing. And they wanted to hang out with the chefs and the chefs wanted to hang out with each other and learn from each other. And they had these Gujarati oh. kids who happened to be in Aspen through a J visa program. Uh, who we had making tortillas uh, with Rosa, and we had these you know, Mexican immigrant kids who were there working for the summer who were making Indian food with Hina, and that is what modern American food needs to be. And it was beautiful to see it, and it was beautiful to see the two of them, uh, the four of them. I'm so excited for Cincinnati. Inshallah. <laughs> um, and Reem, you've kind of, you've done, I mean, you've done stuff like this before, but in this experience, like what's set it apart? Kind of well, what are you looking forward what, to? I mean, when I think about La, La Cucina, like it feels like home, mm -hmm. you know? And when Caleb was talking about like, which city you want to go to? Of course I said, I wanted to go to the homeland, <laughs> Dearborn, Michigan, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because for an Arab in diaspora, like I don't get to see a lot, like, I'm not an Arab community um, as much as I want to be and to be able to, you know, like, it's funny because like I'm involved in like activism with the Arab community here and they're always talking about like, oh, in Michigan, they're talking about you. And it's like, that's so weird to me that I'm like connected to this community out there to see like, actually like our voices being out there, like people are watching and maybe we're inspiring other women of color, other women from our, um, our background to maybe take that leap of faith and um, follow, pursue their dreams. So to me, that felt very important um, to go. I'm looking forward to visiting <laughs> Shatila Bakery <laughs> um, and, you know, being inspired myself and connecting to other communities out there. We're like cooking with a Palestinian chef out there in Detroit. And so, um, but it feels like home. That's, and, mm. it, and home doesn't feel just Arab. It feels Mexican. It feels... Gujarati, it feels like all of these, I mean, I was in that kitchen, you know, for lo very long hours <laughs> with people from all walks of life. And like, sometimes I miss that, like being at Reams. It's really cool because I'm trying to cultivate that. Like our, mm. my space is very much like people from all walks of life. But uh, it makes me never take for granted the time that I had at La Cocina because you learn a lot about the world by the women that you work with. Um, so, yeah, just really looking forward to building that. That's great. Hopefully it doesn't feel, it feels like somewhat of a vacation. Oh. <laughs> it's going to be a vacation. And I'll be cooking, but. I know, comparing to my life, it's a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing every day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's actually Cincinnati's new slogan. <laughs> Wait, are we are we just plugging six Cincinnati right now? I don't know. I kind of okay. like it there. <laughs> like, this is going. The, um, yeah, I mean, also, I think it's significant to see women of color in a restaurant space at an event being the focus of that event as well. And Caleb, you've seen this a lot. Like, what kind of, uh, have you been able to gauge what kind of impact this has on some of those audiences that might not be used to that? Or even some of the chefs that might work with you guys in the kitchen at the time? Like, Yeah, I mean, that's 
such a complicated thing to think about. In my heart, like I entered this work because I think that the people who have, I, I come out of fine dining space, that was like my original introduction to cooking. And I really had a gut sense that people who work in fine dining, they want this food, they want this talent, they like want to know how to just cook yourself. And uh, you go to a lot of these events and people are thinking too hard about how to cook and what to cook and they stop cooking things that really matter. And so when we do La Cocina events, there's really, there has never to this day been any of that pretension or absence of emotion in food. It's really people cooking themselves and cooking this beautiful food. And, and I, I do think that, that that's naturally appealing. On the other hand, when you go into these public facing events, there's still certainly this hierarchy of respect and expectation that's that's just patently unfair to the quality of food that our entrepreneurs put out. And when you're in those kitchens, you feel it. And uh, I obviously, like I operate outside of that. I'm a white male, so that is not often directed at me, but I, I witness it. And it's our organization's obligation to, to try to do something about that, to at least address it, to at least call it by its name, um, and to try to make people aware of it themselves. Really, uh, because I do think at the end of the day, every, everybody will be better fed and far happier when they get over that nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Which is not the word that I had in my mind. And so, um, you know, uh, th these are incredibly talented entrepreneurs. We, we were just at a very beautiful event. I think our food was the best there and not because it was the most complicated or because it had the most uh, contemporary techniques applied to it but because the people who were cooking it really, really meant it. And, um, and, and I hope that that organization that brought us out there sees that and then wants more of it. Doesn't just think that that's a, a cool thing to do once or that's a sweet thing to have or wasn't that nice, but instead realizes that actually everybody who came to that was soul satisfied and full. And they left a lot of those other events uh, wearing plastic wine cups around their neck and hungry. <laughs> 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 you know, and there, and it's great that we have this event right now that we're all sitting here and people will come, you know, listen to everyone talk and care about the book. But there's a time, Veronica, I'm sure you know this, that when La Cocina didn't have this platform, when it was like, you know, just you were talking about earlier when the cookbook was just an idea. Do you remember the days in the beginning? And can you think about how far the organization has come since then, the incubators come since Just then. like about the cookbook? You, you or just, just as a whole, like La as Cucina, a whole, as like a Cucina. whole, yeah. 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 Like, I want to hear about the, the good old days. <laughs> the, but it, yeah. it was, I always believe in La Cocina, um, but it's also because uh, woman in Mexico, or when you immigrant, uh, you come to the United States, you always, when I was um, telling all my friends and my family that we, I, I want to have my business, and they say, you're crazy, you cannot do it. And, you know, you have this on, in your mind always, like when they say, we want to have a book, I, I didn't, uh, it's going to be just a small thing. And now when I see the book, it's something big, because we are, you know, it's a big uh, people in the book. So uh, it was... Um, I've been waiting for this, mm -hmm. and I is what I've been after. I've been in La Cocina for uh, 14 years. I know La Cocina is big. I know La Cocina it's it's is doing something big for San Francisco. And I always ask when I saw a, a little a lady with a little car selling mm -hmm. food, and I always say, "You should go to La Cocina. You mm -hmm. should go oh. to La Cocina always," because um, and there is a lot of people outside right now that they don't they don't know and they don't understand how much, how much help we have with these people. And they change our life. I, I, I do want to note that like you, we do these panels a lot and there's a lot of La Cocina did this, La Cocina did that. So there's like two very important things for me to say at every one of these events. No, number one is that La Cocina uh, o only does what these entrepreneurs have always been capable of doing in the first place. And our role is not to help, we intentionally don't use that word, or empower the women who are up on this stage have helped themselves repeatedly over the course of their lives and will continue to do so. And they are very powerful to begin with. And so our role is really just to make sure that y'all understand that. Mm. Like that's it. And that's what the, that's what the book really is. Yeah. And, and, 
And Veronica, for this story in particular, you know, Veronica opened the, was the first one to open a restaurant at La Cocina. And so anything that we as an organization know about opening restaurants, we learned from Veronica. And so anything that we brought to bear on Reams, anything... I thank, I thank Veronica yeah. for some <laughs> Yeah, and we, we, we learn so much that way. Yeah. And the entrepreneurs who, you know, uh, it's just, it's, incre it's incredible to see. And, you know, Veronica's been there for the whole time. But the same thing, I mean, Reem, you know, mm -hmm. everything we know about being a James Beard semifinalist, <laughs> we learned from Reem, you know. And, and even Lamise, who, you know, Lamise really uh, was a, a new set of challenges for La Cocina, uh, certainly coming into the kitchen. And we do a ton of events. We do have a ton of events that... Uh, have to do with alcohol. And so we had to have a really serious conversation about what kind of a community are we? How do we welcome someone into that community who has some discomfort around the way that our events are, are managed and can we be a place for everybody? The organization always has to learn, always has to hear the people who are in it and ha has to understand that they, they are leading this organization. Uh, that, that's the purpose of, of being a service organization. But mm -hmm. I mean, a little humble. I mean, I think you guys facilitate us stepping into our power. I mean, I think if more people did that, we, we could realize our power quicker. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the first time that um, I did like my first catering for the board. I was like 30 minutes late. I was frazzled. I had like stuff all over the, and I remember like walking into that room and I had no idea Tracy Desjardin was on the board. Like they don't tell you anything. They just kind of like <laughs> throw you into the gauntlet. And they're like, explain your food. And I don't even know what I said, but I remember like, running out of there crying and like I quit you know like calling my mom um but you know those things make you stronger so the next time you do it a little better I remember like one of my first events was for like the taste of the warriors and they're mm. like you got this like they they do like <laughs> you know they do a little bit of facilitation <laughs> um but I think it's like I think it's an understatement the kind of market that they have access to and I think you know, they give us the opportunities and it is on us to get what we put in, but I wouldn't say, I yeah. just wanted to they had a, a little bit to do with like, that. So. Yeah. It's really, really like <laughs> comparing yourself, opening a restaurant yeah. without going to La Cocina and opening a really solid business while you are a student at La Cocina. Like I'm talking about within the Arabic community, everyone want to open a restaurant just yeah. like, oh, I have the money, I have the key, uh -huh. and rent it, and then they end up like a failure in their mm -hmm. business. So my idea was like a long time ago when I was like begging my brothers that I need the money to open a restaurant, and I think when they said no, it was for my sake. Mm. And when this lady, Luba Gomez, she led me to this nonprofit <laughs> organization, I am really, cha I, 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 I changed a lot. It's not just being a chef in this business, it's how to be a leader for your mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. How for to your let, community. yeah, exactly. So I think La Cucina changed many things, many aspects in my life. I'm talking about my life specifically. How now, I, I like financially, I was like below zero. And that was my, really chance how to build, you know, this solid food business. So when they did ask me for to do my business plan, that was like the first thing. I never ever in my life heard what's the meaning of business yeah. plan. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, I just yeah. want to cook. I thought like La Cucina is going to help me get the key of a restaurant and start. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's my idea about La Cucina. And I said, you know, my family, when I start studying and going, attending workshops and everything, they said, Khali La Cucina Tinfaq, they're not going to do anything for you. Like they, they thought like it's kind of like funny story to be part of La Cucina. Now my brothers are offering me <laughs> money to make this, you know, yeah. project, my dream, true. Yeah. They said, oh my God, what La Cucina is doing is such an amazing job. And this is, doesn't come from one day. It comes like for since I attend La Cucina in 2015. The way I changed, the way, you know, I learned a lot, the way they connected us with different resources. And honestly, I'm, I'm telling you, like, for Arabic Muslim women to be now there is not easy. There is a lot of challenging. And I think every time I have a challenge, 
I have knocked, you know, La Cucina door and I said, guys, I want to make this dream come true and I need you to help me over that. So it's a great organization. It's really a great or nonprofit organization. My, 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 one, of my, one of our hopes for the book is that as you read through the book, there's like so many incredible individual stories that you get in there that are like Lamise's. The comprehensive point throughout the book, hopefully, that resonates with you is that all, all of these entrepreneurs are put in a position where they have to take significant amounts of risk. We live in like an entrepreneurial culture where risk is valorized mm -hmm. for people who are able to absorb risk mm -hmm. uh, and denigrated for people who don't have a cushion, that they shouldn't have taken that risk. Mm -hmm. And the point for La Cocina is to be able to be in a position to absorb that risk to some point so that these entrepreneurs are able to participate in that economy in the way that anyone else who has the social and, and financial capital to take risks would be able to. And so it, it's an incredible thing to see. And ev everybody fails. And uh, we live in this particular economy where failure is really valorized. And so to see our entrepreneurs only fail by arriving 30 minutes late for a catering and then get nominated for a James Beard Award means <laughs> we are failing faster than the general economy. You know, the interesting thing, I remember when I first started uh, writing about La Cocina and the chefs that exist as La Cocina, uh, you can go to an event, you can talk to one of them, you can eat their food, and you feel like crying, laughing, you feel like celebrating. It's like, it's an emotional journey, but it's also... I realized like, oh, it's a selfish thing because I was thinking what I pulled from it. And Reem, I think you could speak to this. How, do you, how did you change as a person being able to have these responsibilities, like through, like as a part of La Cocina, being able to have these new responsibilities, figure, figure your own path out, um, get this national acclaim, and then, you know, how have you changed as a person with that? I mean, I think I've built some Teflon, but I, I want to say, like, they convinced me not to quit maybe two or three times in the course of my business. Like, I remember those days where I was like, I'm done. <laughs> and somehow they, like, got me back into the game, you know? And, like, a lot of businesses don't get that, you know? Um, I think um, realizing that I could fail helped me because, um, like, I... I had something to fall, like I had a, uh, like family to fall back on in a time where I didn't feel like I had family. Um, and I think one of the things that I, like the thing that I, because I wanted to start a business, I was kind of like Mama Lemia, so I was like, okay, they're just going to help me find a play, you know, mm -hmm. and they're like slowed me down. And I think in that, that time, that like year and a half before I even launched Dreams, like I went through some real soul searching of like what felt important to me. And I think being in that kitchen, um, I, I come from a social justice background. I wanted to like escape to have this little bakery because there was too much pressure on me in other parts of my life. And then like, I think I went back to like why I'm doing this in the first place, which is I wanted to grow and I wanted to like give voice to other women. Like I wanted to do what La Cocina was doing on a larger scale. So I feel like that, like going back to my sense of purpose and my mission and my values was something so invaluable that has helped me and build my confidence. But I still try to like get Caleb to come in a room with me <laughs> when it's scary. You know, like mm -hmm. I think you know, that's a process. Like, I think as women, we do have imposter syndrome. And especially as women of color, like, I feel like so much is at stake all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, failure is not an option. And, like, remembering that failure is okay because you, like, learn from it and it's really not a big deal at the end of the day helps kind of widen your imagination of what you can do. And I think that's, like, it having... I mean, I'm like that kid that never like left the house after I graduated. Like, I still come to La Cocina for everything, and they don't, and they don't even question it. You know, to have something like that to help me. Um, it's home. Like it's said. home. Mm -hmm. It's home. It, it's like always the place that I come back to. So, I'm you know I'm still evolving, but I think you know, I, like noticing how much tough, like how much you know grit. Like yeah. the grind is really like toughens you up a little bit and. But like still a place to fall apart, you know, like I think that's the place I go to, to fall apart so they can help me put myself back together and go back out in the world and do whatever I need to do to be a leader. There is a big difference to be an original chef 
versus chef from YouTube. Is this what she's done? Uh, like, you know, I, I know, I know there was a lady, is she what she's talking about? So there is an authentic food. You know, you could put your recipe and you could do demos, but no one is gonna put the touches and the texture that you put. And I think when you said like, I serve authentic food, it just go back to experience many years ago to give that flavor. Mm. I don't know if yeah. that was like the right answer. Like, Yeah, I mean, I think like, I mean, I make authentic food, but it's authentic to myself <laughs> is the best way that I explain it. Like, um, you know, especially because we're like, a lot of us are in the diaspora. We're not, we, we don't have connection to the land that like our, the generations before us came or our ancestors. So we can't, it's not going to be the same exact ingredients, right? It's going to be the ingredients yeah. from where we are. Mm -hmm. And we, and that's the beauty of food is that we adapt. I, I always say like Ar Arab food is like very flexible, right? Because if you go to <laughs> Palestine, even like from one village to the other, the they're going to make makluba a different way. And it's just like based on what they have available to them. So... I think that's awesome, right? Because it can be really flexible and you can adapt to the places. And for us, I really love to honor the space I'm in, which is California, um, a land that like, you know, hopefully doesn't get completely uprooted from the people that are indigenous to that land. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of that displacement. Um, but to celebrate, you know, the, the farmers who are working off the land and using those ingredients so that I try to sort of do that in my food. Is it creative? I don't know if it's creative. It's just kind of, that's how my people cook. Like, that's how I say it. Like, Arabs cook seasonally. So it would make sense that I would use California ingredients to, to cook my food. Um, but I, I don't like the word fusion because I, I feel like that, yeah. um, that's like a forcing of cultures for the, for the purpose of, like, indulgence. It's usually, like, happening from, like, a third party that's fusing those cultures. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Whereas like, uh, like Mexicans, for instance, like the, the wave of like Lebanese and Syrian that, that came in the early 1900s, like they brought the shawarma. I joke that that's the one thing the Mexicans took and made even better mm -hmm. because they made it al pastor. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you know, um, but, yeah. but, but that to me is a much more organic way of fusing culture because like people are taking a food that they feel inspired by and adapting it to their own specific circumstance. And to me, that's beautiful. I like, wish that we would do more of that. So I look forward to that Mexa Arab. Mexa Arab. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're very like, we are historically a little bit wor <laughs> word policy around yeah. brand at yeah. La Cocina. Yeah. And authenticity when Veronica started was a word that I was like pretty vehemently against. And it's interesting how that's evolved and the conversation has come back around. But in 2005, that was a word that was used to really pigeonhole Mexican chefs in particular and, and immigrant chefs into specific kinds of cuisine that both limited their imagination, uh, their presentation, and the perception of the value of their food. And so, you know, there's an impetus to want to call yourself an, an authentic Mexican producer to distinguish yourself from the American chefs who've never been to Mexico who are cooking Mexican food. <laughs> and I understand that. The real deal. On the other hand, there's that same problem that when somebody goes into a Huarache Loco and is told that the taco is $4 because it's organic masa and people are paid a living wage and this family needs to make a living, that that $4 taco is no longer seen as authentic. Mm -hmm. And so there, it's, it's challenging. What Reem just said is like beautiful about the fusion. And, <laughs> and, and you know, you hope, you hope that people collide into each other at La Cocina in a way that inspires them to do all kinds of new things. And I was really serious about Lamise and Alma making a TV show together called Tacos al Pastor because I think watching the two of them cook together and learn from each other <laughs> would, would be mind blowing. <laughs> There's a name for it already? Tacos, well, I made it all up. Oh. Nobody, <laughs> nobody signed any deals, but we're available <laughs> afterwards. We got our lawyer on speed dial. All, right, all right, this is going to be our last audience question, and it's actually from social media, and it says, for each of the panelists, what do you want the next generation of La Cocina community to know? That we can do it. It's like <laughs> we having La Cocina, it's, <clears throat> it's nothing impossible. I mean they build your dream and if you believe in you 
you can believe in the cocina. And it's, you can, you know, it's... I would say call on us, like the ones who graduated, because La Cocina is really busy. <laughs> 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 they have a lot. I'm like, how do they do it? Do it. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, I, I feel like I got a lot of value of, like, being inspired by Isabel from El Buen Comer and, like, the, the sort of generation right before me. Mm -hmm. And, like, I want to pay it forward, too. Um, and so, you know... Come over to Reem. Come stage for a little bit. Um, yeah, I, th I think building, building sort of cross-generation feels very important. I just want to tell anyone, <laughs> if you, instead of traveling from country to a different country, just get in La Cucina. <laughs> many things, many prep tables has a different countries, like Nibali, Indian, <laughs> Mexican, Latino, you know, Jamaican food. La Cucina is like a whole world cuisines in one spot. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, an ama amazing, you know, like when we have visitors, like they introduce us to the visitor. Oh, this is from Palestine. She is from Nepal. She's from Mexico. So it's really a, a, like a spot where you can try many different food in one spot, you know, and instead of traveling, just come and stop by. <laughs> You'll have a bite from each cuisine. Yeah. We, so. we, we named the book We Are La Cocina Recipes in Pursuit of the American Dream after much debate. The Recipes in Pursuit of the American Dream because the American Dream, while it is nominally the reason a lot of people begin their businesses, it is uh, in a lot of ways uh, an unreachable fallacy that's not supported by the infrastructure that we have in this country. <laughs> And you should know that when you start a business. Uh, and then we are La Cocina because uh, there's a, again, there's an impetus to pull on heartstrings and to talk about how beautiful it is. And you guys really made it feel beautiful. And, and I appreciate you guys for that. But it's a hot kitchen that's smaller than it needs to be with more people in it than there should be because there are more people with needs than we know what to do with. Mm -hmm. And the day-to-day -day grind of starting a business, putting your life on the line, it isn't always about a dream. There's a lot of people in our organization who are cooking because they have to. They never imagined themselves to be chefs. They imagined themselves to be something else entirely, but this is maybe one of the few pathways available to them. And so I think it's important to understand that like your individual struggle is real. Mm -hmm. And the pain and the trauma of that individual struggle is really, really real. Uh, the beauty of it is that you are never alone in struggle. And so you come into that kitchen and it's an infinite amount of people struggling through some, some real grimy things uh, in pursuit of a better place. And we really, like, we learn from each other. Like, we look like the Jamaican food. <laughs> oh my God, this is the way they cook their food? <laughs> oh, for Nibali, people like doing momos. It's really kind of like an art. <laughs> she has staff that doing momos, Nepali momos. Like, Everything you learn every day in La Cucina, you learn something different. It's really an amazing. Live art momos now available at the corner of 6th and Howard at Beanie's <laughs> Kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Justin. Thanks for covering these stories. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, Justin Phillips in the house. Um, so there's two parts to that. One, it's my job. <laughs> and, <laughs> The other part is just uh, kind of what you guys experience too. Like, you're a journalist for a section of your, well, you're a journalist all the time, but you're a journalist for a section of your day. And then the stuff that you cover during the day, you take home with you and you process. So getting to speak to these women, like I can, I have memories of La Cocina that go back to when I first started this job. And it's just, I mean, it's a very uplifting space to be in. And uh, the food's amazing, so. Thank you. Um, so uh, now there's an informed tradition to ask all speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? I'll start. <laughs> You know, after what I <laughs> so whatever I saw through my life, I wish I am one day a president for one day and stop war and let peace all around the world. No violence, no war, no killing. Live with each other like as Adam and Eve. We are like those our and we are the kids. We have to love each other. I wish I'm praying for that one day. Yeah, done Inshallah. with the Inshallah. Inshallah. I will will more La Cocina or 
some organization, <coughs> sorry, like La Cocina, because they made our dream through and make our dream, make happy families and, and good families make good work. I think we need to play a little more. <laughs> um, we don't play enough. I am part of an anti-imperialist soccer team <laughs> where the score is always 2-2. Two -two and <laughs> it's not about scoring the goal, but the path to get there. So playing a little bit more anti-imperialist soccer, I would say. <laughs> uh, less, less of me, more of them. <laughs>